Prime Minister, uh, President Whitaker, ladies and gentlemen. As I was listening to the uh, introduction of the day, I was thinking how much I would have enjoyed just being a participant all day long. After spending uh, a, a good part of my life working in the United Nations system and having the opportunity to see firsthand uh, the challenges, but also uh, the problem-solving modes of uh, more than 120 different countries, uh, I'm sure there are lots of stories to be told and uh, stories that would resonate with you. But I was very uh, eager to accept the invitation to make uh, just a couple of introductory remarks, although in my current position I have to be rigorously apolitical and non-prescriptive, all of the things that, uh, as a good policy wonk, I've spent my life working on, um, I find that I can ask some questions, and, uh, and they're very much along the lines that uh, both uh, President Whitaker and our MC raised with you at the beginning. So first of all, my very warm congratulations to the International Development Institute and So Change for conceiving of this conference. It's uh, a very important topic. Not a new topic, but a very important topic because we haven't got it right yet. I was, uh, as I was preparing, I was reminded of uh, the, the publication Fast Company. Um, and an, a number of years ago, it was trying to promote the, the notion of an idea virus. Uh, the notion was that an idea that just sits there and does nothing is really quite useless. Uh, but an idea that moves and grows and infects everyone it touches. That's what they mean by an idea virus. And it struck me that my hope is that this day and this place will incubate just such ideas. Because I think you really do have the potential to envision development alternatives, and that is sorely needed. Is that too grandiose an objective for a simple one-day symposium? Uh, I think not. Because when we look critically at the state of the world, our performance is simply not good enough. Whether it's the poverty of the majority, the excessive consumption of the minority, the fragility of our environment, or growing concerns about security, we just have too much unfinished business. It's a time of dramatic and fast-paced fast technological change and a recognition that our future is very much linked with those with whom we share this planet. And I, too, would like to echo uh, that the, uh, the people of Nepal and surrounding areas are very much in our thoughts and prayers today. We do not yet fully understand how to avoid a collision between growing ecological pressures, economic expansion, and social cohesion. As I said, this is by no means a new analysis. And yet, the promises of the decades of the Brundtland Commission, the Earth Summit, and a series of successive UN conferences on sustainable development have just not been fully realized. I think to be charitable, uh, sustainable development remains a work in progress. So it's a most worthwhile topic for your consideration and coincidentally as Lieutenant Governor it's also a conversation that I've been having with Ontarians close to home. I make no claim to being an expert on this topic uh, but as I say I do have some thoughts based on some of my observations and experiences. The title of this conference, Beyond GDP, suggests that our economic structures and development models have for too long been based on an assumption that economic growth is the ultimate goal, with the corollary that the more we produce and consume in the world, in, we are better off, and we're, we'll all be better off. The belief is that economic growth will lift everyone, including the poor, to higher levels, and that more money will be available to pay for programs to help the most, vul most vulnerable. The newer sustainability model, on the other hand, 
suggests that society's goal should be to enhance and sustain the quality of economic, social, cultural, and environmental well-being for current and for future generations. In this latter model, the elements are related like three wheels on a tricycle. A block in any one wheel means a lack of progress toward the goal. You may just spin your wheels or go in circles. Setting economic growth as the only focus is like trying to ride a unicycle, something better left to circus performers. Some will quickly point out, as RMC did, that the earlier paradigm of economic growth seems to have been quite successful. Since the Second World War, along with expanded wealth, health has improved, life expectancy has increased, infant mortality has decreased, literacy rates have gone up, etc. The problem is that the benefits have not been widely shared or evenly shared. According to the UN's Human Development Reports, 20% of the world's population, largely in developed countries, consume close to 80% of the world's resources, often at great expense to the environment and cultures. If I may return to the analogy of the tricycle, social capital and natural capital simply can't be divorced divorced from economic capital. It's the research of a Canadian, Professor John Halliwell, that suggests that beyond a certain level of financial security, happiness or subjective well-being does actually not increase with increased wealth. And if he were here this morning, he would undoubtedly ask all of you to rise up and sing the old campfire song, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. I won't do that. But John Halliwell uses this song to demonstrate some of the important findings of happiness research. First of all, that our happiness levels increase when we're doing something together with others. And also that the repetition of positive statements reflects a positive neural pathway in our brain. So there is a physiological basis for understanding happiness. And that brings us, of course, to discussion of the World Happiness Report. It was actually our guest, former Prime Minister of Bhutan, who in 2011 introduced a resolution at the UN General Assembly inviting member countries to measure the happiness of their people and then to use that as a guide to development of public policies. I suspect that the Prime Minister will undoubtedly discuss the case study of Bhutan itself and the resulting happiness reports, including the third, which was just released on April 23rd of this year. Without going into that report in any great detail, let me just say that it's gratifying to note that Canada is one of the top five countries on measures of subjective well-being. The analysis underlying the report's conclusions actually identifies six key variables, only one of which is related to the old economic model, and that's the GDP per capita. But the other five variables are so important. Healthy years of life expectancy, social support as measured by having someone to count on in times of trouble, trust as measured by a perceived absence of corruption in business and government, the perceived freedom to make life decisions, and finally, generosity, as measured by recent donations adjusted for differences in income. So only one of those is based on the economic paradigm that we've come to know. Differences in social support, incomes, and healthy life, and life expectancy are actually the three most important factors. Another fascinating finding in the 2015 report is actually the evolving neuroscience base for happiness. We now know through new understandings about plasticity of the brain that we can measure feelings of well-being, but more importantly that those feelings of well-being can actually be transformed through experience and also training. 
You may recall that in 1995, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, 50 communities around the world that were examples of success in 10 areas that were important to the United Nations were identified. This was called the We the Peoples Award. And the selected communities ranged from communities like the Bombay Pavement Dwellers to Mondragon, the richest cooperative in Spain. What did those 50 communities have in common? They'd all been motivated to act by pain and hope. They felt their problems deeply, and the situation was no longer tolerable. But they also had a vision of a much better future for themselves. And upon analysis, it appeared that they went through four different phases of a self-empowerment cycle at different times, moving from powerlessness to protesting to proposing and to partnering. If we'd had a happiness framework at that time, we might have observed them going from unhappiness to happiness as they built trust and social capital. It's also important to note that this was not a linear progression, but rather a spiral. So the cycle actually repeated itself many times, and with each turn, the overall situation improved. It should be noted that these communities empowered themselves, sometimes with the help of outsiders, but often not. So I'm left wondering, if we consider ourselves agents of change for a better and fairer world, how do we then move those who are happy to help those who are not? How do we give unhappy people hope? Without the push for change, is a vision actually enough pull to mobilize action and to change behavior? This may relate to training people in such things as empathy and compassion. But how do we build all of that into our systems in vastly different cultural and economic contexts? And I think that very much relates to the three themes that our MC suggested at the beginning of the morning. Furthermore, what is the relationship between happiness and unhappiness? If happiness is an aspirational goal and provides hope, does it follow then that if it's not achieved, disappointment may lead to blame, which destroys trust and social capital? We've seen too many situations where communities and countries look to their governments or the UN for help in overcoming poverty, building positive community relationships and protecting their environment, only to discover that funding or programs are not available, that government or country pledges have not been funded, or that the funds are eaten up by the bureaucracy that's actually been established to deliver them. As we enter into the 70th anniversary year of the United Nations, there are proposals currently being discussed to add happiness to the sustainable development goals to their measures and indicators. And this hopefully will, will be considered by the UN Summit of Heads of State in September uh, at, the, at the United Nations. And while that's all very laudable, I hope that someone is also giving some thought to preparing for a backlash if the funding and bureaucracy once again falls short of delivery. Because in my mind, there's a real cost to raising hopes and expectations that are unlikely to be met. And I'm an eternal optimist. So there are lots of questions for discussion. I know you'll be inspired by the Prime Minister of Bhutan, and I hope that your conversations to come during the day will actually become that idea virus that I spoke of earlier. And let me conclude with just uh, one thought, and that is a reminder that the matter of measuring quality of life, the matter of actually finding a way 
to integrate economic prosperity, inclusive economic prosperity, protection for the very fragility of our environment, and a way to enhance social cohesion in our communities has relevance not just to international affairs, has relevance to this neighborhood, to these communities, to the province of Ontario. And I, I think we want to be giving some thought uh, to practicing what we preach here at home as well. On any measure, Ontarians are so very fortunate. But we mustn't be complacent because we too seek to build social bonds, to teach people empathy, to confront corruption and reward the rule of law, protecting the natural and built environment. Because when we do these things, we'll be much closer to achieving the just and sustainable communities that I think all of you are interested in or you wouldn't be enrolled in a program such as this. So thank you very much for allowing me to uh, be a very small part of this important dialogue. I really wanted to come uh, to reinforce uh, that there are many decision makers, there are many of us in public life who are so strongly supportive of the kinds of conversations that you're going to be having today uh, because we do need to change and change is never easy for any of us. So I wish you a most productive day.